Robin Hood Radio presents Your Health with osteopathic physician Dr. Kim Tripp, a show presented monthly on Robin Hood Radio, discussing the challenges faced and the solutions that are available for keeping vital health and well-being throughout our lives. And now, here's Dr. Tripp. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Your Health with Dr. Kim Tripp, osteopathic physician. This is the health show created to bring you vital information and discussion of all sorts of health issues on your mind and in your life from the unique perspective of traditional osteopathic medicine. So what we always do first then is clarify what osteopathic medicine means for our new listeners. Osteopathic medicine is practiced by fully licensed physicians in the United States with a DO degree a Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine degree. Our practice is based on the essential relationship in all living things between structure and function. In other words, the natural interdependence between anatomy and physiology, or that between the physics of the body and its chemistry. As osteopathic physicians, we use our comprehensive and precisely detailed knowledge of anatomy and physiology to promote health and healing in our patients. We work gently with our hands to help your body restore optimal function based on optimal structure. Our medical specialty is therefore called osteopathic manual medicine, manual as in hands. We receive uniquely in-depth training in anatomy and physiology and their relationship within your body in the context of a full physician's medical training. Only U.S. trained osteopaths are fully licensed physicians and have all of the current medical pharmacopoeia, nutritional science, and full medical training at our disposal. This means that your individual treatment may include a wide range of approaches but it will always be founded on our gentle hands-on work. We practice from the unique perspective of first looking for the health in our patients rather than merely finding illness and disease. Our practice has been especially effective for, but is not limited to, musculoskeletal and other structural issues, as well as chronic headache, gastrointestinal problems, post-concussion syndrome, sleep disturbance, allergies, and many, many other issues. We work together with you, the patient, to help you build health and vitality in your body, mind, and spirit as the solution for health problems rather than only treating the disease symptoms. So in the radio show here, we tackle health issues from this point of view. What can we do to help you build your health and vitality in order to prevent and heal injuries and disease? And we do that by giving you some basic information about the problem to help you understand what's happening as well as offer solutions and guidance for helping yourself to heal and stay healthy based on our clinical experience with patients in our practice. Before we get started on today's topic, let me just remind you that you can listen to all of the prior Your Health shows online at your convenience, such as those on back pain, nutrition, carpal tunnel, concussion, etc., by going to the Goldman Trip website www.goldmantripp.net. Click on the radio show icon, then scroll down and click on the individual show by topic. There are more than 40 shows available. You can also get the most recent show podcasts on the Robin Hood Radio website itself in the on-demand section. Unbelievably convenient at right at your fingertips. Today, we're going to start a series on the human endocrine system. That is, our system of glands that control so much of our physiology and function. The endocrine system glands produce and secrete hormones. That is, chemicals produced in the body that regulate the activity of cells or organs by acting as chemical messengers. These hormones are produced by the gland and then are circulated to the target tissues to regulate the body's growth, metabolism, sexual development, and function. The hormones are released into the bloodstream and may affect one or several sets of organs, tissues, or specific cells throughout the body. The components of the endocrine system are the hypothalamus, pituitary, pineal, thyroid, parathyroids, adrenals, pancreas, yes, the pancreas that we otherwise know from the digestive system, 
and the reproductive organs, the ovaries and testes. The endocrine system is regulated by what we call a feedback mechanism. That is, in an analogous way that a thermostat regulates the temperature in a room. Most of the glands are regulated by the hypothalamus and pituitary in concert together. The hypothalamus is a part of your brain. The pituitary gland is a small gland that sits suspended from the hypothalamus and resting in a bony saddle in the middle of your skull, just below your brain. The hypothalamus and pituitary sample levels of different active hormones in your blood and respond to those levels by excreting controlling hormones that tell the glands to make more of their hormones if the levels are low or, in some cases, actually inhibit the glands from making more of their hormones if the levels are high. The hypothalamus and pituitary are the controlling entities for most of the endocrine system. In general, the hypothalamus acts by controlling the pituitary, which then sends out the specific stimulating hormone for a given gland. If this all sounds a little confusing, hang on, because we will explore the well-known thyroid as our first endocrine gland, and the roles of the hypothalamus and pituitary will become more clear as we work through how the thyroid works. So, on to the thyroid. The thyroid gland is the gland that controls our overall metabolism. It is so important and complex that it has its own national association, the American Thyroid Association, and its own professional journal called, logically enough, Thyroid. The thyroid gland influences all physiological mechanisms and anatomical structures in the human body through multiple physiological mechanisms, including direct effects on gene transcription, thereby influencing all aspects of our health and well-being. Leonardo da Vinci is generally credited as being the first Western world anatomist to draw the thyroid gland as an anatomical organ in 1508 of the Common Era. But Thomas Wharton named the gland thyroid in the 1600s. The Greek root for the name thyroid is thyroides, meaning shield-shaped. The thyroid is the shield-shaped, or wing, or butterfly-shaped gland in the front of the throat above the collarbones. It generally has two lobes, one on each side, a right lobe and a left lobe, with a smaller isthmus in the middle connecting the two main lobes. The exact location and shape are somewhat variable, including there can be a third lobe, but it generally weighs about 25 grams, which is a little less than an ounce. Since the thyroid wraps partially around the throat, it is closely associated with the trachea, our airway, and esophagus, our food tube. Four tiny parathyroid glands rest on the back surface of the thyroid lobes, two on the right and two on the left, and we'll consider these in more detail in a future show. The thyroid is wrapped in its own membranous capsule and layers of the fascia of the neck. Several of our front neck muscles run very closely next to the thyroid gland. For anatomy geeks, that would be the thyrohyoid, sternohyoid, and sternothyroid. The thyroid has its own ligament that connects it to the trachea called the suspensory ligament of the thyroid, logically enough, or the ligament of Berry, named for the first person to identify it. The thyroid has its own arterial blood supply and venous and lymphatic drainage, all of which can be negatively impacted by compression of the adjacent muscles and fascias in the neck. The thyroid gland is innervated by nerves from the autonomic system, including both parasympathetic and sympathetic nerves. Recall that the autonomic nervous system is a kind of automatic nervous system, with the sympathetic aspect responsible for our fight or flight set of reflexes, and the parasympathetic being responsible for our rest and digest set of reflexes. The tracks of these nerves that supply the thyroid run through the base of the skull and the neck, and so they can be subject to irritation by compression from nearby tissues 
and anything that impacts the balance of the autonomic nervous system, including stress, can affect thyroid function. So then let's review the basics of thyroid function. The thyroid is responsible for producing two hormones, thyroxin, or thyroid hormone, and calcitonin. Thyroxin is responsible for stimulating all aspects of metabolism, including many aspects of growth and development from infancy to adulthood, including normal musculoskeletal and central nervous system development. Calcitonin is part of the complex set of hormone interactions that are responsible for ensuring the balance of bone growth and turnover throughout our skeletal system. We'll explore calcitonin in more detail when we talk about those little parathyroid glands that are also key to that system. Meanwhile, the big picture is that thyroid hormones are vital to energy metabolism, liver and cardiovascular health, and immune function. Too much thyroid hormone gives us one set of problems. Too little thyroid hormone gives us a different set of problems. Although the symptoms can overlap and so can be a little bit confusing. If we are hyperthyroid, meaning our thyroid gland is overactive and producing too much thyroid hormone, our heart rate, bone turnover, and many aspects of metabolism are overstimulated. This can lead to osteoporosis, cardiac distress, trouble sleeping, autoimmune reactivity, remember thyroid hormone stimulates the immune system, unintended weight loss, and overactive bowels leading to diarrhea and other digestive distress. We can be nervous and anxious and have trouble focusing or finishing tasks. An overactive thyroid can be quite dangerous as it can result in serious heart disease, heart attack, or heart failure. If we are hypothyroid, meaning our thyroid gland is underactive and producing too little thyroid hormone, our heart rate, bone turnover, and many aspects of normal growth, tissue repair, and metabolism are understimulated. We can be depressed, fatigued, stiff and achy, constipated, losing hair, gaining weight without dietary changes, or find our skin drying out. We can also have cardiac symptoms such as palpitations. An underactive thyroid can also be dangerous for all these reasons. What causes an over or underactive thyroid? Well, let's revisit how the thyroid is regulated to answer that question. Recall that the endocrine system of glands is managed, if you will, by the hypothalamus of the brain and the pituitary master gland that sits below the hypothalamus. This so-called hypothalamus-pituitary-thyroid axis determines the set point of thyroid hormone production. The hypothalamus and pituitary sample blood passing by and react to the level of thyroid hormone in the blood. If it's too low, the hypothalamus releases a hormone called thyrotropin-releasing hormone, which stimulates the pituitary to release a hormone called thyroid-stimulating hormone, logically enough, otherwise known as TSH. TSH travels to the thyroid to stimulate thyroid hormone biosynthesis and secretion. If thyroid hormone levels get too high, this inhibits release of these thyroid stimulating hormones, but there's no direct inhibition of the thyroid with this mechanism. This is why when your thyroid function gets tested with blood work, the TSH levels are also checked as well as the thyroid hormone level itself. Very high thyroid stimulating hormone means your thyroid is underactive while very low thyroid stimulating hormone may mean that your thyroid is overactive. An overactive thyroid is generally treated with thyroid inhibition, including partial surgical removal or radiation. An underactive thyroid is generally treated with a thyroid hormone supplement. There are numerous versions of this available and you should work with your physician to find the best form for you. Thyroid disease of either kind can be caused by a variety of influences, including too little or too much iodine. 
Iodine is an essential nutrient used by the thyroid gland to make thyroid hormone. If there is too little iodine, the thyroid gland cannot make enough thyroid hormone no matter how much the pituitary and hypothalamus keep trying to stimulate the thyroid gland. Iodine deficiency is famous for causing a goiter, a large swelling in the front of the neck, which is thyroid tissue overgrowing in an attempt to supply thyroid hormone. Too much iodine can also be problematic for thyroid function as well. 150 micrograms per day is the recommended amount of iodine needed, with more needed for pregnant and nursing women, who should always talk with their doctors about their iodine intake. There are many substances that can affect iodine metabolism and thyroid function in general, and a great deal of recent research demonstrating surprising sensitivity of the thyroid gland to stress, environmental pollutants, and agricultural chemicals. Smoking and excessive radiation exposure have a clearly negative effect on thyroid function. Very, very high intakes of cruciferous vegetables, such as kale, cabbage, and turnips, has been found to cause hypothyroidism in animals, meaning low thyroid activity. However, cruciferous vegetable consumption does not appear to increase the risk of hypothyroidism in people unless accompanied by iodine deficiency. One study in humans found that the consumption of 150 grams per day, which is about five ounces a day, of cooked Brussels sprouts for four weeks had no adverse effects on thyroid function with adequate iodine intake. So go ahead and eat your kale, but make sure you are getting enough iodine. Good dietary sources of iodine include seaweeds, low-fat fish like cod, shellfish like shrimp, yogurts, and iodized salt. Other thyroid gland inhibitors include stress, which raises our blood cortisol levels that then inhibit thyroid function. A long list of environmental pollutants and household and agricultural chemicals have been found to disrupt endocrine function in general, including thyroid function, in people and animals. So be very cautious when using any landscape or household chemicals. These chemicals are called endocrine disrupting chemicals, logically enough, and they're defined by the World Health Organization as an exogenous substance meaning coming from the outside, or mixture that alters function of the endocrine system and consequently causes adverse health effects. The UN published a list of these in 2018, and more information on this is available at www.unenvironment.org. There are a number of diseases that affect the thyroid. The two most common problems are Graves' disease and Hashimoto's thyroiditis. The American Thyroid Association describes Graves' disease as an autoimmune disease that leads to a generalized overactivity of the entire thyroid gland, therefore hyperthyroidism. It is the most common cause of hyperthyroidism in the United States. It's named after Robert Graves, an Irish physician, who described this form of hyperthyroidism about 150 years ago. It's seven to eight times more common in women than men. Graves' disease can cause a goiter to form, as well as all the overactive thyroid symptoms discussed earlier, including developing prominent eyeballs. Exactly what triggers the body to develop antibodies to the thyroid gland and have this autoimmune reaction can be hard to determine. It is generally treated initially with thyroid inhibiting medications, but sometimes radiation is used to kill the thyroid tissue or surgical removal may be needed in some cases. Hashimoto's thyroiditis refers to inflammation of the thyroid gland. There are many possible causes of thyroiditis. Hashimoto's thyroiditis, also known as chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis, is the most common cause of hypothyroidism, underactive thyroid, in the United States. It is also an autoimmune disorder involving chronic inflammation of the thyroid gland. This condition tends to run in families. 
Over time, the ability of the thyroid gland to produce thyroid hormones often becomes impaired and leads to a gradual decline in function and eventually an underactive thyroid. Hashimoto's thyroiditis occurs most commonly in middle-aged women, but can be seen at any age, and it can also affect men and children. Exactly what triggers these autoimmune responses can be hard to determine. The environmental toxins can be chief suspects, as well as genetic and familial tendencies. Post-viral syndromes, in other words, what happens after we suffer a viral illness, postpartum issues after childbirth, or even severe allergic reactivities. Essentially, any known autoimmune trigger can set it off. So how do we keep our thyroid healthy? Eat a well-balanced, toxin-free diet with adequate iodine. Maintain adequate hydration and avoid smoking, excess radiation, and environmental pollutants. Get plenty of fresh air, stretching, and exercise that helps minimize stress stimulates your cardiovascular system, and keeps your neck flexible and strong to ensure good blood flow and lymphatic drainage to and from the thyroid gland itself. Which brings me back to osteopathy and to the close of today's show with a reminder that an osteopathic physician who is a specialist in osteopathic manual medicine can be helpful for endocrine issues of all kinds, working gently with our hands, with the involved organs, nerves, vasculature, fascias, capsules, and associated tissues to release restrictions in the physical tissues of the glands and diaphragm and blood and lymphatic flow, as well as to help balance the autonomic nervous system function based on anatomical detail and to help with nutritional issues and support for whatever procedures or treatments you may be going through. Recall that all of the endocrine system is a complex physical entity with connections between all the parts that need to be open, flexible, and moving freely with excellent neural conduction from the nerves, optimal arterial and venous blood flow, and lymphatic drainage to remain healthy, vital, and functioning normally. Well, I'm out of time again. This concludes the first in our endocrine series but you can revisit these show podcasts anytime on the Goldman Trip website. Meanwhile, thanks so much for your attention to Your Health with Dr. Kim Tripp. Remember, you can email your comments and suggestions to yourhealth at robinhoodradio.com. And if you have a health issue yourself and would like to find out about how we might be able to help you in our practice of traditional osteopathy, we're at our offices in Sharon, Connecticut, Dr. Kim Tripp and Dr. Andrew Goldman, Goldman Trip Osteopathic Healthcare, 860-364-5990, with evening hours Wednesdays and Fridays, or on the web at www.goldmantripp.net. I'll be looking forward to being with you next time. Till then, you take care of yourself, enjoy your health, and thanks for listening. <music>